So let's talk about managing anticoagulation and thrombosis remotely. We're going to use a case-based uh, approach. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So let's take our first case. Uh, this is a 55-year-old female patient who calls about a three-day history of progressive left leg pain. And on the phone, she describes to you unilateral left lower leg pain, redness, and swelling from the knee to the midfoot. And on your questioning, she tells you, yes, indeed, it does pit when you put your thumb on it. Uh, she has no systemic symptoms. She has no chest pain. She has no shortness of breath. She has no clear provoking factors, but has been much less active due to self-isolation and admits to spending lots of time in bed. She is not a suspected uh, or confirmed COVID case. Uh, she has no uh, history of local trauma. Her past medical history, well, she's obese, she's type two diabetic, she's hypertensive. She's never had a thrombotic episode. Her last blood work was done about uh, nine months ago, uh, and that was within normal limits. And now it's up to you to manage this patient. And the last thing that she wants to do is go anywhere near a hospital. Uh, so uh, what do you think? Is it safe to initiate empiric anticoagulant therapy uh, by telehealth? Uh, Lana, can I uh, turn this one over to you? Uh, yes, thank you, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. Um, so on this slide, you can see the important points that Alan has highlighted. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you're going to notice what we use to um, grade somebody's risk of DVT. And this is the Wells criteria for DVT with all of the um, factors listed there. And based on our patient's description of her symptoms, um, we've identified that she has pitting edema to the left leg. And we've asked her to measure her leg, and it turns out that she does have a more than three centimeter difference in leg circumference around the calf. And so that gives her a score of two, which would suggest that her risk of DVT is actually high. And so when we're looking at this patient and calculating a risk score to be high, we need to take a multi-pronged approach where we want to initiate anticoagulation while we're simultaneously organizing for investigations of the DVT. Um, next slide, please. So what we're going to do um, with this patient is, as I mentioned, we do want to initiate therapy for DVT while we're organizing for testing to be done. And because the direct oral anticoagulants are so simple to administer, the two that we would recommend using in this setting are those that are straight to pill without requiring low molecular weight heparin use first. And the two options are listed there. So there's apixaban or Eliquis with the dosing regimens there. And the second option is rivaroxaban or Xarelto. And it's important to note that the dosing is different for deep vein thrombosis compared to atrial fibrillation. So just want to highlight that there is a, a dosing strategy um, that you need to be aware of. And while we're faxing this prescription to your patient's pharmacy, we do need to organize for imaging and lab investigations to be done. And so you're going to complete a requisition so that your patient can go to the nearest um, diagnostic imaging facility, and whether that is an outpatient um, place or your hospital, um, I, it does need to be done. And so we would advocate that the imaging be done within the next 24 hours, if at all possible. And we're also going to ask that you do routine blood work on your patient, which would include a CBC so we can evaluate their baseline hemoglobin and platelet count, as well as a creatinine um, to look at what their renal function is so we can ensure that it's safe to continue the direct oral anticoagulants. And while we're also doing all of this, as Alan mentioned, we do have these great tools and information sheets on the Thrombosis Canada website. And so you can download this information sheet on, um, you have a DVT and you can email that to your patient or get it to them somehow um, so that they know what symptoms uh, to monitor for and when to seek uh, additional uh, medical attention. And the additional medical attention is necessary if your patient endorses symptoms of chest pain or shortness of breath, because that is concerning for pulmonary embolism, and we don't want to miss a pulmonary embolism. And so it's important to instruct your patient to go to hospital in those, um, in those settings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
So we organized for the patient to have an ultrasound and these are the um, findings of the ultrasound. Um, so on the right hand side here, you can see that uh, the popliteal vein is highlighted. And then on the very right hand side, when you try to compress the vein, it doesn't compress indicating that there's a thrombus present in the popliteal vein. And so the popliteal vein is considered part of the uh, proximal venous system. So it is a, a proximal deep vein thrombosis. And this does require ongoing anticoagulation management. And depending on which direct oral anticoagulant you initially started, you would continue with the regimen as prescribed. So the next thing to figure out is how long are you going to treat your patient for? When do you need to organize for a follow-up visit? And when can you safely organize for an in-person visit? And I think a lot of that is obviously going to depend on the status of COVID and what we're doing with physical distancing and when clinics and other healthcare facilities can open safely. In the meantime, I would suggest that what you do is have um, your patient continue with their anticoagulant, continue to monitor for improvement of their symptoms. And it's important to know that it's going to be time that also works to improve their symptoms, not just the anticoagulant. And so we're really looking for week to week improvements in their symptoms and not necessarily daily improvements. And so I would recommend having a follow-up um, call with your patient if you can't see them in person at least a week after you diagnose the blood clot uh, to ensure that their symptoms are improving and that they're tolerating the anticoagulant well and that they're not having any adverse side effects from the anticoagulant such as bruising or bleeding. And so when do you want to do that in-person visit? As I mentioned, um, it would be important to do it as soon as is safe to do. Um, and the alternative would be if you can set up a video chat or some sort of FaceTime chat, Skype, for example, with your patient, that might be able to um, at least give you some visual interaction with your patient until you can see them in person. Uh, next slide. So these are other things that you want to consider. So what I didn't mention when you're sending your patient for an ultrasound, um, this will depend on your, your facility where you're doing the ultrasound, but many places will do a whole leg ultrasound, which can be helpful in diagnosing a distal DVT or a calf vein DVT, for example. So if you have the option of asking for a whole leg ultrasound, I would advocate for doing that in this time of um, the COVID pandemic so that you can minimize additional visits to imaging facilities um, and, and potentially get a diagnosis with your first ultrasound image. And so if you do diagnose a calf DVT or a distal DVT, in the time of COVID, I would recommend that patients be treated with therapeutic dosing of anticoagulation. And again, this is to um, mitigate recurrent visits to healthcare facilities unnecessarily. If we were outside of the pandemic setting and we had the option of doing serial ultrasound, that might be a nice approach that we could use. But in this setting, I would consider using therapeutic dosing of anticoagulation, which would be the same as what we saw for the proximal deep vein thrombosis. And the duration of treatment in this setting, I would say would probably be about three months rather than potentially longer, which we might do in a proximal DVT, for example. One of the other things that you may find on your ultrasound is a superficial vein thrombosis, so a greater saphenous vein thrombosis rather than a deep vein thrombosis. And on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a strategy that we have listed on Thrombosis Canada website for different treatment options that can be utilized. And again, I do think that this is um, a time where using anticoagulants is very acceptable so that we can minimize um, patients having to return for repeat imaging. And so you can use one of the strategies that are listed on the right hand side. Or again, I do think you could use therapeutic dosing the way that you would for a proximal or distal leg DVT, again, for a finite period of time. And when it's safe to see your patient in person, you can discuss next steps. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Lana, be before we move to the to the next case, there was a very interesting question that came up that I would like to raise at this time. Uh, strike while the iron is hot. Uh, somebody asks, well, how do you know this patient doesn't have a cellulitis? And maybe we should make sure that they don't have a cellulitis before we go uh, straight to anticoagulation or some other diagnosis. You know, perhaps you can just make a comment about 
uh, the urgency and the approach to anticoagulation when there's going to be a delay uh, in, in obtaining an ultrasound. Absolutely. Um, so it is really important to initiate anticoagulation as soon as you suspect a deep vein thrombosis. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. So as soon as you do suspect a deep vein thrombosis, it is important to initiate anticoagulation because the potential risk for embolization um, to a pulmonary embolism is certainly significant that you don't want to miss um, and not provide anticoagulation. And so as long as it is um, safe to provide an anticoagulant while you're getting investigations going, that's what we advocate for. And you're absolutely right that there may be a cellulitis or muscular injury, for example, that's contributing to the patient's symptoms. And what I would suggest is if you have the ability to either do a visit um, with your patient on video chat, or if they can send you pictures, um, and you can see if there's any redness or an ulcer, for example, that might lead you to think that uh, an infection is more likely than a DVT, um, then you can certainly uh, do a, a, another dual-pronged approach where you're uh, providing anticoagulants and perhaps antibiotics until you get those investigations with an ultrasound to rule out deep vein thrombosis. Thanks very much, Lana. Yeah, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, uh, on behalf of Thrombosis Canada, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's program. Uh, I'd like to express thanks also to Dr. Duquettis and uh, Dr. Uh, Castellucci for their um, excellent presentations and answers to your questions. I also would like to thank our sponsor, Bear Canada, for their unrestricted grant for this program. And be sure to visit our website regularly and often as we add new materials all the time and are always updating our clinical guides and tools. So uh, with that, I wish you all uh, a safe uh, uh, afternoon and safety throughout the rest of uh, COVID. Bye-bye now.